Senate Finance Committee will come to order, members, April 5th, 2022. Um, <coughs> welcome, Senator Limmer. And uh, we have the Judiciary Bill before us, Senate File 2673. And after your opening remarks, we'll go to Mr. Turner to go over the spreadsheet. And Mr. Backus is here also. Um, and then we'll do, and then we'll have the commissioners if they would like to come up and speak. So that'd be great. Senator Limmer. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, before I begin, uh, just a little background on the bill and how we developed it, uh, especially uh, the dollar amount that we arrived at. Uh, I think it's right at $200 million right now. Uh, we were given the opportunity to, as a committee, uh, define our needs, and we came to a, an amount of about 199 million, and, uh, and uh, leadership allowed us to, to round it up to $200 million. Uh, and that was to accept an amendment uh, and I'll talk about it later, uh, for payment for sexual assault rape kits. At that time, we did not know what the appropriation was, so there was a blank appropriation, which I will have an amendment for uh, later on after presentation. Uh, on that note, we talked to Mincasa and the Sheriff's Office, and we decided that an appropriate dollar amount would be $3.5 million for that rape kit provision. Uh, there'll be an amendment uh, later. Now, uh, onto the bill. This bill touches on all aspects of the criminal justice system from start to fi finish. Youth intervention, criminal laws, sentencing guidelines, police, prosecutors, public defenders, judges, prisons, and probation. <clears throat> Making our criminal justice system work for Minnesotans is critical to keeping our communities safe. It takes transparency, accountability, and it does take resources. This bill provides all three and will keep, keep, our, straight safe, keep our streets safer for the people in Minnesota. Last year, we increased the youth intervention program budget almost $600,000 a biennium. This budget reflects an additional $3 million as it sits right now. The Youth Intervention Program is a proven system that requires a local match, greater accountability to the Department of Public Safety, as well as the legislature. Other recently formed nonprofits uh, who have been uh, seen in the news of wanting to participate in that type of community action uh, are mostly untested and unknown. We thought it would be best to put this money toward youth intervention programs instead, where there is a track record and there is a local match. As the newspaper headlines uh, continue to tell us of rising violent crime in the metropolitan area, uh, as we be have begun to see where it's filtering into uh, outer suburbs and even into uh, outstate neighborhoods. This bill uh, focuses more on law enforcement uh, in order to direct our attention to the immediate threat to our public. It provides a more robust level of not only punishment but deterrence in the form of sentencing. And that's directed at the very worst of the worst of our offenders that we are seeing in our communities now, especially those that are using firearms to carry out their, their criminal acts. This bill contains several initiatives to bolster our law enforcement. It includes appropriations for body cameras, pathways to policing, recruitment, retention, meritorious bonuses, education reimbursement, equipment for MinSKU skills programs, grants for violent crime enforcement teams, and crime prevention, Ramsey County gunfire detection, and law enforcement mental health. The bill also enhances penalties for fleeing a police officer, carjacking, car theft, used in a subsequent crime of violence, organized retail theft, repeat violent offenses for offenders that are a danger to public safety, and habitual offenses that follow a pattern of criminal conduct. 
This bill removes authority for judges or pros prosecutors who waive a current statutory mandatory minimum sentence for perpetrators who commit a violent crime with a firearm. It's important to note that 40% of convictions do not result in a prison sentence for those who commit a crime with a firearm. Uh, we are attempting to stop that by giving this mandatory minimum statute and write it into law. Uh, this bill helps ensure prosecutors and judges are imposing penalties set by the legislature. It improves transparency for the decisions that lead to early releases as well as failures to charge to the fullest extent. It does provide accountability of criminals through this more robust, through more robust probation funding. Many years ago, the legislature wrote a law that obligated us to pay for 50% of the probation costs in our state for, and reimburse that 50% to counties. We have not lived up to that promise. This bill will. This bill provides funding, 50% of the funding ongoing. Uh, it directs it to uh, Minnesota Community Probation Officers as well as Minnesota Community Corrections Act. Um, we uh, prefer to keep those, those two uh, probation services as well as the Department of Corrections Probation Service, um, the process and the structure intact. We're simply funding it to the degree that the legislature agreed to many years ago. Uh, Minnesotans are looking to restore faith in our criminal justice system. I can't tell you how many times I've had calls from constituents, not only in my district, but throughout the Twin Cities, do something. Um, they have a, they, the public has a, a belief that government is not doing anything. Uh, we need to do something, at least from our perspective. We're legislators, we write laws, we improve laws, we can make laws work better for the system of the criminal justice system, um, and this bill will go in that, in that forward direction. I believe we must have accountability in our state. The public demands accountability, and they demand transparency. And with that, Mr. Or, uh, Madam Chair, uh, I'll turn it over to Mr. Turner to explain the financial aspects of the bill. Thank you, Senator Limmer. Mr. Turner. Madam Chair bridge. and members, uh, I'm gonna go over the spreadsheet, the one titled, In Your Packet, Senate File 2673, First Engrossment. We'll start with the Supreme Court on line three. Judge and employee compensation, uh, the committee has a 6% increase. That's $2.3 million in fiscal year 23 with straight tails. Court of Appeals, line nine, again, a 6% increase for judge and employee compensation, $621,000 with straight tails. Then we moved on to district courts, line 15, again, the 6% increase uh, for judges and employees' salaries, it's $14.8 million with straight tails. Moved to public defender on line 21, increased salary and staff, $50 million with straight tails. Then sentencing guidelines, there are three provisions in the bill with costs. The first is on line 27, Senate file 3356, publicly searchable sentencing database. The fiscal year 23 appropriation is uh, $265,000. Tails in 24 is 289,000, 289,000, and in 25, 87,000 uh, dollars, and uh, that's ongoing. Then on line 28, we have seven, uh, Senate file 3752, commission meetings recorded and publicly available. It's a one-time appropriation of $4,000. We have Senate file 2841, uh, county attorney reason for dismissing felony charges with a report required. Uh, 23 cost of uh, $569,000. 
with uh, tails in 24, 25, and subsequent of $145,000 a year. We move to the Department of Corrections. The bill has eight sentencing provisions with bed costs. Uh, I'll list them here. Senate file 2844, fleeing a police officer felony enhancement. Senate file 2843, car theft used in subsequent crime. Senate file 2573, carjacking. <coughs> Senate file 2673, mandatory minimum firearms only. Senate file 2850, term of imprisonment increase from two thirds to three quarters. Senate file 3487, organized retail theft. Senate file 3224, aggravated and consecutive sentencing provisions. And Senate file 3190, fourth degree assault expansion to include healthcare professionals. So you can see on line 45, I've subtotaled um, all the bed costs, they aggregate in 23 to $2,705,000. That increases in 24 to $8,412,000. And in 25 to $15,434,000. And we have one last provision under the Incarceration and Pre-Release Services Division. It's on line 47, Santa Fe 2893, Interstate Transport Reimbursement to Counties. That comes in at $250,000 uh, in 23 with uh, ongoing tails. We move to Community Supervision and Post-Release Services Division within the Department of Corrections. We have increases to the three probation delivery systems in the bill. The first is on line 53, Community Corrections Act subsidy increase of $16,250,000. Uh, and that's ongoing. Then uh, on line 54, we have the county probation officer reimbursement increase of $5 million ongoing. And uh, on line 55, we have DOC supervision services at $3,750,000 with ongoing straight tails. Move to page two, we have the Department of Public Safety, a, a long list of uh, grants administered by the department. The first one is on line 63, Senate file 2848, police recruitment advertising campaign. It's $1 million one time. Senate file 2847, pathways to policing, $1 million ongoing. Senate file 2890, Ramsey County gunfire detection, $2 million one time. Senate file 2934, mental health treatment for law enforcement and first responders, it's $1 million ongoing. Senate file 2796, statewide VSET grants, $2.5 million ongoing. Senate file 534, emergency management readiness grants, $3 million ongoing. Senate file 2989, youth intervention programs, $3 million ongoing. Senate file 3042, school safety specialists, two additional specialists, $250,000 ongoing. <coughs> Senate file 3332, prosecutor training, $100,000 ongoing. Senate file 2889, Ramsey County Sheriff Crime Prevention Grant, $3 million one time. Senate file 2892, body cameras for local law enforcement, $5 million ongoing. Senate file 2891, use of force training reimbursement, 10,500 reimbursements at $250 each, comes to $2,625,000 one time. Senate file 2846, police education expenses reimbursement, 500 reimbursements at $5,000 each, it's two and a half million dollars ongoing. Senate file 3073, police recruitment bonuses, 2,000 bonuses at 10,000 each. Uh, that's $20 million one time. Senate file 3223, police bonuses for exemplary service, 250 bonuses at $10,000 each. That's two and a half million dollars ongoing. We have Senate file 3328, police retention bonus program, all officers. 
It's $47 million one time. Then we have Senate File 4134, Minsky Law Enforcement Skills Program, $5 million one time. Senate File 3594, Racially Diverse Youth Shelter Services, $210,000 one time. And then finally, as Senator Limmer mentioned, uh, sexually as sexual assault medical examination costs, the state picking up costs from the county at $3.5 million ongoing. Then the bill has uh, two provisions in it with uh, general fund revenue adjustments. The first is on line 88, Senate file 3029, fee elimination for copies of uncertified court documents. That's a general fund cost of $362,000 in 23 and $395,000 in 24 and subsequent years. And then on line 89, we have Senate file 2857, the Minnesota Family Resiliency Partnership uh, fee reallocation. Uh, it's a fiscal year 23 cost of $1,027,000 with uh, 24 and subsequent cost of $1,120,000. And finally, Madam Chair, uh, on line 93, we have our total net spending uh, for fiscal year 23. It's uh, $203,095,000 with 2425 tails totaling $262,198,000. That, Madam Chair, is the spreadsheet. And now I'll move on to the bill. Thank you, Mr. Turner. Uh, I'm gonna go over Article 1 real quick and then turn it over to Ken Backus for Articles 2 and 3. Uh, in Article 1, we have section one is the appropriation section. It just uh, has the appropriation mechanics of the bill. Uh, sections two to eight are the uncodified riders that implement the spreadsheet. They're on pages two to 18. Uh, I'm not gonna go over them. Again, it's more or less uh, repeating the spreadsheet, but if there are questions about any of the language, I'd be happy to answer them. And so then I'll move on to the codified language which starts on uh, section 9, page 19. Section 9, the language for um, Senate File 3317, sexual assault examination costs, uh, the state picking up the county pay, or the, the, the county responsibility on that. Uh, there will be an amendment which places a three and a half million dollar cost into the bill. We left it blank in committee. We move on to section 10, Senate file 3356, sentencing guidelines, publicly searchable database language. Section 11 on page 20, Senate file 3752, the sentencing guidelines meeting recorded and publicly available language. Section 12. Uh, Senate file 2441, sentencing guidelines report on county attorney case dismissals. This is, requires an inclusion in the sentencing guidelines report to the legislature. Section 13 is the portable recording systems or body cams language. That's Senate file 2892. Uh, it's a $5 million ongoing appropriation with a 24 or 25% local match. Uh, the commissioner must give priority to law enforcement agencies located outside the seven county metro area that do not have portable recording systems. Move on to line, or page 22, section 14. Uh, this is Senate file 2857, the Minnesota Family Resiliency Partnership fee reallocation. It's the first half of that re reallocation. Um, it moves, uh, $30 from the general fund to the Minnesota Family Resiliency Partnership uh, when, when allocating divorce filing fee revenue. Section 15 on line 23, Senate file 3029, that's the fee elimination, elimination for copies of uncertified court document language. And that goes all the way to page 25 
Rev Section 16, County Attorney Reporting of Criminal Charges and Cases Dismissed, Senate File 2841, Senator Limmer. And then we move on to 17, Section 17. It's the second half of the Senator Housley provision for the Minnesota Family Resiliency Partnership fee reallocation. And this moves $30, $30 per marriage license fee um, from the general fund to the partnership. We have section 18, uh, again, cost for the medical examination for sexual assault. This is the codified language for Senate file 3317, Senator Benson. And we have section 19, a peace officer bonus program. This is Senate file 3223, Senator Senjum. Uh, these are bonuses for exemplary service. And uh, that, Madam Chair, is the end of Article 1, and I'll turn it over to Mr. Backus for the remainder of the bill. Thank you, Mr. Turner. Well, we'll have questions after Mr. Backus. Good morning, Mr. Backus. Good morning, Madam Chair, members. Um, so I'll be walking you through Articles 2 and 3 of the bill. And just for your information, there's a detailed summary in your packets if you want more detail on any provision or if you want to follow along that way. And I'll be doing a pretty big picture, high level overview. Uh, so if you want more details about anything, just let me know. Uh, and I'll also indicate provisions in the bill uh, where the bill or the spreadsheet is appropriating money or carrying costs for them. So I'll begin with Article 2, which is entitled Criminal Law and Sentencing Changes. It begins on page 28 of the bill. Sections 1 and 2 make conforming changes. Sections 3 and 5 expand the use of the Ignition Interlock Device Program for certain DWI offenders who are being released from custody before trial, and it prohibits them from being forced or coerced essentially into using a specific vendor as well. Section 4 requires the revocation of a person's driver's license who is convicted of the new fleeing a peace officer in a motor vehicle crime, which is created in Section 27, which I'll get to in a few minutes. Sections 6 and 10 to 12 change the term of imprisonment period for persons who are sent to prison. It increases it from the current two-thirds of the executed sentence to three-quarters of the person's executed sentence. The bill uh, includes $612,000 in fiscal year 23 for this and $4.844 million in the 24-25 tails for this. That's spreadsheet line 41. Sections 7, 8, 15, and 22 address an oversight in law uh, regarding persons who are convicted of first-degree murder of an unborn child. Under current law, there's no specified minimum term of imprisonment for these offenders, and this, these provisions include that. Section 9 requires that certain members of the Minnesota, guidelines, uh, Minnesota Sentencing Guidelines Commission be subject to Senate confirmation. Sections 13, 14, and 31 provide for enhanced penalties for theft of a motor vehicle uh, if the thief then uses the motor vehicle within seven days in furtherance of a crime of violence. The bill appropriates $86,000 in fiscal year 23 and $511,000 in the fiscal year 24, 25 tails for this uh, spreadsheet line 38. Sections 16 to 19 provide for mandatory minimum prison sentences for persons who commit a third violent felony offense or a sixth felony overall. The bill includes 759,000 in the fiscal year 24-25 tails for this spreadsheet line 43. There's no cost in this biennium. Sections 23, uh, sorry, 20 and 21 prohibit judges from waiving the statutory mandatory minimum prison sentence for an offender who commits a first time violent offense while possessing or using a firearm, or in some cases where the offender's accomplice does this. The bill appropriates $1.28 million in fiscal year 23 and $12.496 million in the fiscal year 24-25 tails for this uh, spreadsheet line 40. Section 23 essentially overrules a 2020 Minnesota Sentencing Guidelines Commission change that established a presumptive cap on the overall length of state felony sentences, i.e. the maximum period of probation. 
Section 24 expands the fourth degree assault crimes protections for certain healthcare workers, uh, victims. Uh, the bill appropriates $10,000 in fiscal year 23 for this and 57,000 in the fiscal year 24, 25 tails for this spreadsheet line 44. Section 25 expands the criminal abuse of a vulnerable adult crime to criminalize caregivers who administer controlled substances in an unauthorized manner to a vulnerable adult victim. Section 26 establishes uh, a specific crime of carjacking and provides mandatory minimum prison sentences for its violation. Uh, the bill includes 430,000 in fiscal year 23 for this and 3.453 million in the fiscal year 24-25 tails. Uh, that's spreadsheet line 39. Section 27, I mentioned this earlier, establishes the new fleeing a peace officer in a motor vehicle crime if the offender uses the vehicle, operates the vehicle in a culpably negligent manner while fleeing. The bill includes $10,000 in fiscal year 23 for this and $82,000 in the fiscal year 24, 25 tails. And that's on spreadsheet line 37. Sections 28, 30, and 37 make conforming changes. Section 29 expands the doxing crime to protect prosecutors, defense attorneys, judges, and correctional officers from being doxed. Section 32 establishes the new crime of organized retail theft. Uh, the bill appropriates 277,000 in fiscal year 23 and 1.644 million in the fiscal year 24, 25 tails for this spreadsheet line 42. Sections 33 and 34 allow law enforcement and prosecutors to have greater access to information on accounts from financial institutions when investigating identity theft crimes. Sections 35 and 36 expand the third and fourth degree burglary crime to include certain situations where a person steals while inside a building that is otherwise open to the public. Section 38 ex extends the time period that a search warrant on a financial institution is valid. Uh, Section 39 requires law enforcement to report specifically on occurrences of carjackings to the Department of Public Safety. Section 40 requires law enforcement to retain any recordings made of custodial interviews, bookings, or implied consent proceedings for a specified period of time. Section 41 provides for the Department of Public Safety to conduct a pilot project to determine the efficacy of oral fluid roadside testing to determine the presence of controlled or intoxicating substances for persons stopped for DWIs. Section 42 contains a revised instruction to add statutory cross-references relating to the new carjacking crime. Uh, that's it for Article 2. Article 3 is quite short. It begins on page 58 of the bill. Uh, basically, this article broadens the definition of a search warrant in the DWI law for the purposes of DW driver's license revocations that are based on blood draws to include search warrants from, uh, from adjacent states. And Madam Chair, that's it for Article 2 and 3. Thank you, Mr. Backus. Any questions for Mr. Backus, Mr. Turner, or Senator Limmer? Madam Chair. Huh? Senator Limmer, I have Before we no get questions. into the discussion, uh, I'd like to offer the A60 amendment or have someone offer it. Senator Limmer, is that um, put the bill into the shape that you'd like? Because we do have the commissioners here. Uh, yes, I, I would. Uh, this, uh, this recognizes correctional employees to be uh, included in that doxing provision. Uh, we did not have it. Uh, we did not cover that in the committee. Um, but I think uh, doxing a correctional employee's address uh, could become very important for that individual and their family. And then there's some uh, on line 1.5 that recognizes the three and a half million dollars we were going to install for the rape kit cost. And then uh, on lines 1.2, 1.3, and 1.4, those are minor adjustments that Mr. Turner could explain uh, uh, for the committee. Mr. Turner. Yeah, Madam Chair and members. Um, 
These changes reflect uh, DOC bed costs revisions. Um, the reason they're there is because of uh, line 41 on the spreadsheet, Senate Bill 2850, term of imprisonment two thirds to three to three quarters. When we had sentencing guidelines uh, calculate the bed costs, we had them do it on all these bills individually. And of course, on this one, they calculated on current um, sentences within the prison system. And, it was, and they didn't because at the time they did not exist. The other seven bills, they didn't calculate that longer term on the other seven bills. So we went back and sentencing guidelines and the department made that, uh, that recalculation and this, these small changes uh, reflect that revision of the bed cost numbers. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Turner. Senator Ingebrigtsen moves the A60 amendment. Are there any questions? Senator Ingebrigtsen renews his motion on the A60 amendment. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. Motion prevails. The amendment is adopted. Okay, and I don't see any further questions for Mr. Backus or Mr. Turner. Commissioner Schnell. Good morning. Good morning, Commissioner. Nice good, to see you in person. Good, Thank you. Good morning, uh, Chair Rosen and committee members. Uh, my name is Paul Schnell, and I am the Commissioner for the Minnesota Department of Corrections. I appreciate the opportunity to share the perspective of the DOC on Senate File 2673. As we're all aware, uh, the stakes uh, for ensuring public safety for Minnesotans are high, particularly with the increase in crime over the past several years. We share the goal of creating a safer state, the opportunity to invest in what works and evidence-based proven strategies and policies is more critical than ever. A comprehensive and smart approach uh, in response to crime um, because is necessary because over 95% of those in our prisons are going to neighborhoods and communities across our state at some point. Our safety depends upon their successful integration into our society. Here's the concern. Instead of investing in strategies that address both the state's accountability and re rehabilitation needs, the, omnibus, the Senate Omnibus Bill focuses solely and significantly on increased punishment. Though understandable in light of the challenges we face related to crime, the bill spends hundreds of millions of dollars on similar policies that have failed in the past, relying on what sounds good or feels good, but does not rely on the use of data in public safety policy making. No doubt we must double down to address violent crime and repeat offending, but we have to be honest about the reality that the reality of the work doesn't end with arrest and prosecution. Prison commitment clearly and importantly serves the, the retributive incapacitation and to some degree the deterrence objectives of the criminal justice system. We must not minimize the remaining objectives of rehabilitation and restoration. Madam Chair and members, we must use all the tools and practices and the practices and tools that we know work to make communities safer. I'd like to talk about just two areas of concern in the Senate Judiciary Omnibus Bill and talk about a couple of areas of opportunity. Starting with the areas of concern. Uh, the Senate Judiciary Omnibus Bill includes eight policy bills with prison bed impact. While these provisions, in some instances, profoundly increase sanctions for criminal behavior, they also come at a profound economic cost. Individually, the fiscal notes uh, for the bills uh, exceed and the, and the bed capacity, exceed our existing bed capacity. That said, collectively, the policies will in the long term stretch well beyond the state's existing bed capacity. And while it's the prior, prerogative of the legislature to increase criminal sanctions, in light, especially in light of what's going on, we must be clear that the state's prison and supervision costs will also increase and increase 
dramatically. And the day will come when the state uh, will need to rent beds or increase capacity by building a new prison at the very same time we sit on over $600 million in deferred maintenance for the prisons we currently operate. The approximate collective bed impact of, is as followed, and you have seen this. Fiscal year 23, 258 uh, more beds. 24, 700 more beds. 25, almost 1,100 beds. And in 10 years out, 2032, 2274. Some may argue that the proposed increase will have no real impact because our current population of about 7,500 is lower than it was pre-pandemic. While this is true, it's mainly due to the COVID court backlog. But the courts, as you know, have developed a plan to address that backlog, which along with the needed funding increases for law enforcement, which are included in this bill and, uh, and are important, will have serious, very serious implications for the state's prison population and correctional supervision system. Yes, the DOC does have current bed capacity. But as the courts clear this, we'll slowly move closer to those pre-pandemic levels. And this will happen at the very same time of the bed increases that come from the Senate, uh, comes through the Senate omnibus if this comes to pass. So these policies change, the policy changes in this bill are in addition to what the current capacity changes will be after the courts begin operating as usual. Some may believe that the DOC must be in a great financial position because our current uh, reduced population, but that's not how the prison budget is set. During the 2021 legislation, uh, legislative session, the DOC's operating budget was reduced by $21 million based on the lower population projection for this biennium. These, prop, these projections are calculated by staff of the courts, the DOC's research team, and the Minnesota Sentencing Guidelines Commission. Additionally, similar to staffing, the staffing crisis in law enforcement, there is a real staffing crisis in our state prisons and in many of our county jails across the state. And this bill may exacerbate that crisis. You may recall the legislatively directed OLA audit on state uh, safety in the state corrections facility conducted in the wake of the line of duty murder of Joe Gom and the death of Officer Joe Parisi. In that OLA audit, they found that housing more than one prisoner in the same cell makes our prisons less safe for both the staff and the population. Madam Chair, members, the DOC will put in motion the policies you enact, but we trust that those policies will come with the requisite resources to fulfill our constitutional obligations, staffing levels to operate the prison safely, and the ability to offer necessary rehabilitation opportunities to make Minnesota safer and provide for the rest restoration of victims and communities to the fullest extent. The next. Senate File 2673 does not address the fundamental structural problems that have faced the correctional supervision system for well over 30 years. Yes, the bill does increase funding for community supervision, but it, in, it, it, it does not include the recommendations of the statewide working group convened by the nonpartisan Council of State Governments that would help meet the needs of Minnesota's profound, profoundly underfunded corrections supervision system. Last sam summer, the Senate Majority and Minority Leaders, the Speaker um, of the House um, and House Minority Leaders, Chair Rosen, Governor Walls, the Chief Justice asked the Council of State Governments, CSG, to convene a group of multidisciplinary stakeholders to study the way the state funds supervision in our state and make recommendations. The GRI Council, Justice Reinvestment Council, was chaired by uh, Senator Rosen and had uh, Senator Marty as a member. The council proffered a series of recommendations to the governor and the legislature for this year. Given the structural problems that have existed, we must re revamp the probation funding formula or the, our future legislature will find itself in the very same position we are today. We need a single supervision funding formula regardless of the delivery system options selected by a county. 
Again, while this omnibus includes base funding increase that rewards some counties, it underfunds others based on that county's choice of delivery system. The way the supervision funds are divided, the counties that choose, and I repeat, counties that choose, uh, does not honor that county's choice with equitable funding. So the perennial funding inequity we've sought to meaningfully address with policy and increased investment will not result in the intended uh, outcomes. Just yesterday, a commissioner from Greater, a county commissioner from Greater Minnesota, for which the DOC provides correctional supervision, made this comment to me, and I quote, the Senate Judiciary Committee may be mad at the DOC or at the governor, but I don't understand why they're taking it out on us. I encourage inclusion of the GRI policy and single funding formula in uh, the omnibus bill at a minimum. And in closing, I would just like to, to ask the Finance Committee to, to consider uh, for inclusion a couple of other provisions that we feel are important. One, that would be the uh, support of the DOC's statewide public safety data infrastructure proposal. As we noted in, our, in response to the OLA's prison safety audit, the DOC is, is data rich but often information poor. In other words, we collect a lot of data in our public safety systems that make it nearly impossible to turn those disparate pieces of data into useful, actionable information for the benefit of the public system practitioners or policy makers. This investment is also found in Senate File 3976, and it accomplishes two important goals. First, it replaces critically antiquated DOC systems with modern and secure data analytics to drive effective service delivery. The DOC's base system is long overdue replacement, requiring us to do costly module fixes, thereby we squander a solution-oriented investment. Second, and importantly, this proposal creates a statewide data hub of correctional supervision and public safety data for all counties and criminal justice system partners across the state. With about 100,000 individuals under some level of correctional supervision across our state, Minnesota lacks a uniform, reliable public safety information hub for correctional supervision for all 87 counties, the judicial branch, law enforcement, and the DOC. And during of the judiciary hearing last week, Lisa Walker shared the harrowing experience she and her daughter had as victims of violent crime. She highlighted the statewide uh, communication, uh, the lack of a statewide uh, communication and coordination. And what she did was she identified in very human terms the real benefit of crime fighting benefit of smart data sharing. Members, I would close by just saying that there are other items that were included in our list that we think are important in our letter uh, to you, which are in your packets. Um, but know that beyond our other proposals listed in that letter, uh, know that the DOC is committed to working with you, uh, with Senator Limmer, Chair Limmer, uh, and the members of the Judiciary Committee to do what's needed for the good and safety of our state. And I appreciate your consideration and would stand for any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Do we have any questions? Senator Ingebrigtsen. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and Commissioner, for the, uh, the your comments. Um, I'm sitting here thinking of my previous life, and, and, and I'm going to ask you, do, does the National uh, Correctional Institute uh, still exist for auditing not only state facilities but county facilities? Mm -hmm. Commissioner. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Senator Ingebrigt said yes, they do do some audit work of, of correctional facilities, uh, both county as well as state, and they do offer that, yes. Madam Senator Ingebrigt. Madam Chair, and thank you. And, and has the state of Minnesota participated in this? I know, I asked that question because I know uh, back some years, uh, if the counties were to participate in that and get a good audit, uh, you know, with, with the... Uh, National Correction folks knowing, you know, obviously knowing a lot about uh, supervising and detaining prisoners in jails. Um, um, has the state of Minnesota gone through that particular audit that's itself, or uh, has it been some time, do you know? Commissioner Shell. 
Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Ingebrigtsen, yes, we have. Um, we, we do participate in a range of, the, we use NIC's standards, uh, national standards. The standards also come uh, from the um, uh, American Corrections Association. We have had, uh, our, our facilities have gone through standards work. And then as the legislature also approved the security audit group. Uh, which was put in place, I believe, last uh, session. That work is uh, ongoing, and they are uh, in the midst of, of looking at this, the prison standards, and uh, will have uh, inspectors to do that and report back to that independent group. So, Senator Ingebrigtsen. So, thank you, Madam Chair, and, and to follow up, uh, is that a cost to the state, or is that something that the National Institute uh, uh, comes in and actually does for you at no cost? Commissioner Schnell. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Ingebrigtsen, we there is there is some cost. We we do have staff time that's included in that. The, the members of that group are mostly system. There's a sheriff, ombuds office. There's some legislators who sit on that uh, that audit group. They direct kind of what the focus should be, and then there are a series of inspectors who report back to them uh, directly. Uh, but they use the framework provided by uh, the ACA and uh, the National Institute of Corrections. And one other question, Madam Chair. Senator Ingebrigtsen. Uh, Madam Chair, when you talk, uh, thank you, Sen uh, Commissioner, when you talk about single bunking, I think you are talking about single bunking because we are 25, <clears throat> 25 beds, I think, empty uh, over the last two and a half years. So in other words, we're down, down uh, um, folks sitting in, in jail. Uh, do you factor that in when you, when you talk about uh, about beds at all, uh, most generally they're they're double bunked, aren't they? Are they, are they not? Commissioner Schnell. Madam Chair, Senator Ingerbrets, and some of our correctional facilities were built uh, as the double bunking facilities. Um, the older ones were ultimately modified to be double bunking. Um, we do double bunking, and, and you know, as you know, that many of our corrections facilities are, are barracks based. So it really depends on the facility, its construction. Uh, uh, from originally, um, but we we have right now still water, which is oftentimes when we're at capacity, is double bunked. At present, that is single bunked. Um, we have the ability to put those bunks obviously back in uh, should our capacity uh, uh, increase. Uh, but but when, what we're talking about in terms of that reduction, the 2,000 bed reduction that we have pre-pandemic to today, that uh, is not does not factor in. We are not looking at single bunking in that proposal. That is, at max capacity, our system is right around 9,500 beds. Okay, thank you. Senator Marty. Thank you, Ms. Madam Chair and Commissioner. I um, appreciate a lot of the points you made here. I had a question um, when you were talking about the lack of data and the need for more data. Um, you mentioned a mother and daughter. I wasn't in the, obviously, Public Safety Committee. Was that the same mother and daughter who talked about the violent assault in the JRI task force? And, Commissioner Schnell. And Madam Chair, continue on that then. Was that the situation there was that they had a offense in another county and the other supervising agents did not know about it because of the lack of data and therefore they were out and caused the crime? Commissioner Schell. Uh, Madam that Chair, Senator Marty, yes, that is the, the, the fact that, that, that she talked about. She talked about the fact that she was surprised and shocked that there was not closer communication or collaboration, and that, it, frankly, that the systems itself didn't notify um, that there was contact or an arrest when she contacted um, uh, the agent who was uh, in a southern Minnesota county simply because systemically that communication had not occurred. Senator Murray. Madam Chair, that seems to be one of the most urgent things we ought to be addressing in public safety if we were trying to keep the community safer. Um, I wanted to ask Commissioner one more issue, the, the funding for the probation and supervised release and, and the funding. I mean, when I'm looking at it, it looks like the bill has $25 million for it and, and the request would have been 25.3. So it's basically the same amount, but it's because I have an amendment for that a little bit later, but to just put in the recommendations and how it goes. And the biggest difference there is that it's going to be determined. So in other words, if a county switches from county probation officer to county community action, correct, uh, community action, count, uh, whatever is 
community corrections model, um, that they would, that the funding would track it and so the formula goes there. Who are the winners under the current system if we don't make the change? We put this additional money that Senator Limmer or you are proposing to put in there. Who wins if we don't change the formula to track that? Sen uh, Commissioner Schnell. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Marty, I think the, uh, I, uh, I, it's uh, tough to characterize as winning and losing because I think uh, we've underfunded the system in general. I think as we look at the way the bill is today, um, the, the, the goal from the outset with, with the GRI was to really focus on the funding to the counties regardless of the delivery system. Um, and so, so at the end of the day, that's been that's lost here because it increases funding for uh, for counties that need it, and I absolutely need it for both the uh, Community Corrections Act counties, the County Probation Office uh, counties, um, and but the DOC counties struggle on the felony supervision side because we provide felony supervision in about 52 counties across the state. Not as huge in numbers, but oftentimes over a much broader geographic uh, area, which is what the, the GRI Council really looked at and CSG looked at was a, a formula that, that tried to address that. And I would just add that, that the DOC, the Community Corrections Act, AMC, CPA, the Association uh, of County Probation Officers came together and there is uh, universal support for this. And, and Madam Chair, only Senator on that Murray. point because the Commissioner may not be here later when I do it, I just hope that Senator Limmer will take a look at this. This is not a budgetary difference. It's simply how we allocate the funding. And I think that was one of the powerful things that the Justice Reinvestment Group looked at and how to allocate the funding fairly. And so this is not a push for more money. It's a push for a fair distribution of it. So I hope the committee will consider that later. But I wanted to mention it while he's here still. Thank you, Senator Marty. Senator lopez Franzen. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I was intrigued by hearing Commissioner Schnell, and I appreciate your testimony. It, it's very um, well-rounded in terms of giving an, a, us a good picture of the challenges we have in public safety and how we're trying to tackle it from a legislative perspective. And, and obviously, there, there's differences of opinions and, and different proposals, and this will go to conference. But I, I was intrigued with your data, um, the statewide public data infrastructure. I actually looked up the bill because I, I, I don't serve in that committee, so I haven't seen that. Um, and it sometimes looks like it's not a sexy topic, but when I remember talking to my chief in Edina, that was one of the first things he mentioned, the data issue of not being able to, to know uh, where things are. It's delayed, and, and those are real issues. Uh, uh, data delayed is, 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 a, is a potentially public safety hazard in, in any community. And, and just to, looking at the bill, it looks like it's about $11 million ongoing, maybe even lower, $9 million after 2020. Uh, fiscal year 2026 in the base, uh, and we have an opportunity to do something. I'm assuming that we're spending some money on this already, and would this be a savings if we move into a more modernized system? And I just think uh, our committee, uh, maybe this is not the jurisdiction, but that we really look at it, uh, Senator Limmer, in conference, because I think that is uh, something that I've heard from uh, our law enforcement, that, that we really have struggles, and, and it sounds like, obviously, it's, it's a big, bigger issue for across our state. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Franz, and I appreciate that. I think, yes, we, we have talked to our law enforcement partners, and including uh, your chief, about, about the reality that, uh, that oftentimes they don't know uh, who's, which county people are under supervision with. It becomes really challenging how to reach that probation officer. And I think uh, at the end of the day, we know that, that if you look at crime generally, about 60% of all crime is committed by recidivist people who reoffend. Um, uh, that's a national statistic, uh, but the reality is, is a, the more we can be smart about coordination between all elements of the system, the better off and the safer we're going to be. And that's really what the system uh, intends to address. Just Senator Lopez Franza. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a quick follow up. I, I just think we, we should really look at this, and um, you know, this is not something that the public facing sees, but it's such an integral part if we're going to tackle crime that we equip not just with the resources, uh, physical resources, but also the data, the, the infrastructure when it comes to technology. And I know for a fact that our counties have really old technology on basically everything, and so does our state. And they're big ticket items. This one seems a reasonable one that could actually 
not only save in the criminal justice system and, and, and corrections, but also prevent crime from happening because we have the most up-to-date data and it's across the board. So I really do hope that this gets included at the end of, of this bill, uh, Senator Limmer, and, and certainly know that there is some funding there that we can potentially move. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Schnell. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Friends, I would just say that, uh, yes, we, we know this train, this, the, the need uh, for the system uh, replacement and upgrade is, is, is coming. That train is coming uh, one way or another. And I think uh, the opportunity here uh, at a time when, uh, when crime is a, a major concern, the effectiveness and trust in our system uh, is a concern. Um, we think that this is a fitting investment uh, that, that would serve the public safety needs of Minnesota. questions I'm having technical difficulties here members um, I did want to make a statement um, about the JRI the justice reinvestment initiative and I was honored to serve uh, thank you commissioner for asking me to be uh, serving as a co-chair with Ke Kevin Reese and there has there was um, a lot of talk about this going forward and I would assume there's going to be some amen amendments brought forward the problem is with, uh, there's two issues with the, the JRI. Number one, we are a divided government. <laughs> and JRI um, and CSG have always worked in states that were all Republican or all Democrat. And so we came, they came to a table to a state that a little bit different dynamics. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, the governor did not appoint um, I was asked by the commissioner, oh, end of October, I believe it was, and the governor did not appoint the um, investment, the JRI members until I believe it was December 23rd, something like that. So we were able to get two full hearings in in January, and that's about it. Uh, there was a working group that had worked um, through the fall and the, and the summer, and I think that was on, what was it called, commissioner, um, the service Delivery group? Yeah. The yes. yes. The service delivery group. Um, but there was, in two hearings, and then we extended it a little bit longer, but then, of course, sessions wrapping up, and you absolutely cannot turn this Titanic without a full, uh, the full ability to vet it through the hearings and all the different stakeholders. And there was a strong commitment for the $25 million, and that was the number one priority. And it was um, an investment, and this is from their priorities um, data or term sheet. 22-23 investment with tails based on a base investment plus a workforce investment formula. That's to prioritize supervision of people on felony, intensive supervised release, and supervised re and supervised release. The proposed foundational allocation would cover 50% of the cost of providing supervision in county probation officer counties, as promised in statute in FY 2022, while also increasing funds to Community Corrections Act agencies and the Department of Corrections Field Services to improve the effectiveness of felony supervision across the state. Commissioner, we've done that. Is that correct in this bill? Uh, Madam Chair, I think there has been an, an increase in funding, but it, it did not address the, the, the structural reality uh, that I think the, but at the end of the day, the goal of that group was really to, to find a way to fund the counties uh, equitably based upon the need, the very real need, identifiable need, and to have that uh, it be the formula going forward. And so what, what happened in the system was that the DOC and CCA and CPO were all treated differently based upon the different formulas. And the singular, the singular formula applies to the Department of Corrections like it would to the CPO and to CCA. And we think uh, all of the systems agreed that that was for the ultimate benefit. And so yes, Funding was a critical piece of this. I'm 100% there, and I'm grateful to the Senator Limmer and the uh, J Judiciary Committee for that investment. Uh, but, but I worry that we have kicked the can down the road. At, at a minimum, if it's just even in looking at the way the distribution of these funds happens going forward, in accordance with that formula that, that all three systems agreed upon, 
to me, um, that does not kick the can down the road in terms of another legislature, uh, commissioner, regardless of, of who sits in the executive branch, having to uh, address uh, the very real inequ inequities that exist. So I'm, I'm, I, I am hopeful that at a minimum there would be an opportunity to look at that uh, so that there is an equitable system across the board. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. I, I do just want to say I want to, don't want to put words in Senator Limmer's mouth, but I do think there was concern about usurping the legislature's authority over developing that formula and giving it over to a group to develop that authority, uh, authority or formula. So I, I believe that's where this sits right now, is that uh, we've made that commitment of, on the funding and we'll continue to, to study it, but it takes time. This is a very, uh, this issue is very sensitive all across the board, <laughs> all of corrections and public safety is very sensitive and um, we, just, we need to get it right. I do know the rest of the recommendations that were given um, and that were proposed through the JRI. It was very interesting for me to go through that because uh, you talk to one s subset and they would be very excited about this, number two or number three, but they didn't like number six or they had concerns about number seven. And so this is, we only had two full hearings. I think it was just two, right? I believe it. Two or three, yeah. Two or three. And then, and then we had to get those recommendations to the governor by February 1st of what was being proposed. So that was one month to be able to develop this. Um, very, too short, Commissioner, and it certainly wasn't your fault. Um, I, 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 I feel that it's just gonna take more time to move this forward. But we did put the financial commitment behind this proposal and um, have great hope for that. Madam Chair. Senator Murray. On, on that point, I, I appreciate what you're saying and yes, there were, I think only three hearings. We had a couple other ones after that, but, but I guess my concern is that while you're saying there were some other provisions, other recommendations that not everybody was 100% on board with and so on, the one we're talking about here is just the allocation of the funds and all of the three types of counties all agreed this was a fair way. And the reason I was asking the, not trying to be too obscure or anything, but which counties benefit, I think it's largely counties like in your district would be benefiting more if we had this new allocation than counties like in my area. And I, I think it's just simply a matter of fairness in all Community Correction Act counties, the CPO counties, and everybody was agreeing that this was a fair allocation. And so I, I guess I understand if you don't want to deal with the other recommendations, but this is one to have a fair system. And I believe the legislature still has control over, we doesn't change anything about that. The recommendations of the task force on how to do it, this ongoing group, which has equal amount of representatives from each type of supervision county. I, I, it seems to me that this is more a technicality of how you allocate funding fairly and that nobody seemed to be disagreeing with it. So while you might have concerns, Senator Limmer, about other recommendations in there, that this one is just simply how we spend the money fairly. And so I guess I, I really hope that when we get to amendments that you'll take this one seriously because it is a matter of fairness and it's not me or some of us trying to get better deals for our counties. I think the counties that actually benefit tend to be more rural counties. And um, so I'm, I'm not sure why the philosophical objection to a, a fair funding formula when it actually may help some of the folks who are most concerned about it. Thank you, Senator Marty. We're definitely having technical difficulties here. Okay, any further questions for Commissioner Schnell? Thank you, Commissioner, Thank for you, being Chair. here. I really you, appreciate members. you being here in person, Thank too. You. Thank you so much. And next we have Commissioner Harrington by remote. Good morning, Chair Rosen. Good morning, Commissioner. There you are. Thank you very much. I appreciate the time and the option of being able to come to you remotely uh, today. I want to thank you uh, and also Senator Wimmer and the members of the Senate Finance Committee. Uh, for the record, my name is John Harrington. I'm the Commissioner of the Minnesota Department of Public Safety. And once again, I appreciate the opportunity to testify on Senate Public Safety Omnibus Bill 
267 is. Uh, and I can proceed if you are, if that's your pleasure. Absolutely, please proceed. I will be as brief as a, a previous member of this body uh, can be. Um, and I have provided some more detailed testimony in a letter that I have already sent also. Uh, and I want to start out by saying that I'm, there are a lot of things in this bill that, uh, that for us to be happy about at the Department of Public Safety. Uh, we are pleased to see the inclusion of things like the, the two new safety, uh, school safety specialists, uh, the shooting that we had at Richfield and the bomb threats and the threats to schools that we are seeing uh, are absolutely uh, not going away. Uh, and the challenges that school districts are seeing, especially those that uh, no longer have SROs, uh, I hear from police chiefs and county sheriffs and others regularly that uh, there are definite needs in our school. Uh, the new funding for youth intervention programs, uh, totaling $3 million, is also very, very welcome. It has been a point of emphasis that the Department of Public Safety has uh, brought. We have been increasing our juvenile services. We believe that that is where we need to invest. Uh, that is uh, all too often as we are looking at crime trends, we are seeing cr uh, our juvenile offenders account for larger and larger shares of some of our really very atrocious crimes, uh, whether it is some of the robberies and the carjackings and on that lines. Uh, and finally, I know something near and dear to your heart, uh, the additional VSET funding of two and a half million is also very, very welcome. Uh, we are seeing fentanyl come in in uh, amounts that would, could literally kill every Minnesotan if it was spread out that way. We are seeing drug trafficking come in in very high numbers uh, and new mixtures uh, of fentanyl with uh, Percocet and other drugs that are uh, really decimating the overdose rates we are seeing are out just you know so high. Um, they have essentially tripled as far as we can see from 500 a few years ago to I believe we're at 1500 last year. Uh, local governments will benefit from the local government emergency management grants that will help prepare and plan for our natural disasters. Um, and we think that makes a lot of sense. We need to make sure that uh, all of the counties, all of our tribal nations and the four major cities, um, this is a conversation that is very timely, uh, have good, well-trained and effective emergency managers. And we believe this money will be well spent that way. Um, I am very, very happy. As you know, I've got my background in law enforcement, as Senator Ingrid Britson does and others. Uh, and so the recruitment money, the law enforcement recruitment money is absolutely uh, a long-term investment that we need to make. But I do need to emphasize that it is a long-term investment. Uh, the state's requirements to become a peace officer mean that the investments we make today probably will not show up on the streets for three years. Uh, when you think about a two-year, at least a two-year associate degree and the skills program, even if we expedite that, we still see this as not an immediate fix, but we do believe it is absolutely the right direction to go. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't note, though, that in addition to peace officers, including our own state patrol, who are struggling to get enough recruits in the door to fill our spots, I'm also hearing from fire chiefs and EMS directors who are also citing uh, shortages uh, in they are struggling to both recruit and retrain, retain uh, quality first responders. And I think that is an area that we, we need to also look at uh, because public safety isn't simply cops on the street. Uh, we are an important component, but we are one, only one part of a three-legged stool of the, the different many parts that make up public safety. Uh, finally, the $5 million on body cams uh, for body cameras and data storage is a great investment to provide both respectful and ethical policing. Uh, Body-worn cameras are one of the most important steps we can take to ensure police accountability. And I can tell you from my own departments that I've run, it's supported by the officers on the street who understand that their actions will be fairly viewed when they have the body cam video to support their testimony. And it's also supported by the chiefs of police and the sheriff who need clear evidence if they are to issue discipline uh, and so this is supported on both sides there. Uh, I will tell you that I am disappointed that the bill doesn't contain some of the critical investments proposed in the governor's budget uh, designed to both enhance community safety across the state of Minnesota. And we put forth a strategic plan that I thought took a more holistic approach to addressing 
both the recent and the ongoing spike in violent crime that would make investments in prevention, which is the most cost-effective way of stopping crime. It is, the, it is the way that most people would rather have. Most people would rather not be victimized. They'd rather have it prevented at the front end rather than have us catch them on the back end and hold people accountable. They'll take either or, but if they had their preference, most of us would prefer just simply not to be bothered. It doesn't fund an intervention at the levels that we think it could, and it doesn't really in, invest in some state enforcement that we are getting calls every day at the BCA to provide. Um, I'll start with prevention. Uh, the $10 million in community crime prevention grants that we've asked for uh, really was going to give local communities a unique opportunity to tailor make the kind of prevention activities that they need for their communities. We don't believe that the Department of Public Safety uh, you know, can, can dictate a one-size-fits-all. We really do believe that local departments and local communities know best about what their needs are. They'll know best what crimes they're seeing. They'll know what best will work. And they'll know what best the community resources will, that will fit that. Uh, I will note that, uh, you know, and I, I appreciate uh, Senator Limmer's uh, in funding of traditional opportunities, but I will tell you that some of the new programs like our faith-based initiative, the 21 Days of Peace that we ran last year in the Twin Cities, showed consistent reductions of up to 45% drops in violent crime in some of our hottest corners in the Twin Cities area. Um, those faith-based initiatives really have both galvanized the community to come out and retake their corners, and it has kept the peace uh, over and above sending a cop to those corners. We look for $10 million investment in community policing models. And I really think this is really a matter of building trust. Uh, we in public safety have a lot of conversations about the lack of trust. And a lack of trust means that witnesses don't come forward, that victims don't feel like they can call the police and get resources. And so community policing is a method for building and rebuilding trust where it has been broken down. And so we really do believe things like uh, the, the programs that we've seen out of St. Cloud with the cop houses uh, really have brought community and their police together in a coalition where good things then happen. Intervention, $12.5 million investment we asked for in grants to provide services to victims of both domestic violence, sexual violence, child abuse, and general crime. The, the pandemic years have been really, really hard on domestic violence. We have seen women being assaulted more frequently. Uh, a, one, in one of our communities, a third of the homicides that they have seen this year have been women. Uh, and they have been, they've been killed in some really awful, awful ways. And so providing additional resources for domestic violence is something that I think we need to seriously look at. Um, the fact that we are starting to come out of COVID and hopefully that will mean that women can go back to their doctors and go back to back to work where they can, where sometimes the evidence of domestic violence or their kids will be back in school where the evidence of child abuse can be visible uh, will help. Uh, but we can tell you that the isolation of uh, the past couple of years has really had a negative impact on women in particular in terms of violence. Uh, we had also, as I mentioned, asked for four and a half, uh, 4.8 million for these community outpost houses. This is a proven strategy across the country for community policing and community intervention. It allows us to get intervening means, whether it's drug treatment, uh, you, know, you know, other addiction programs into the hands of the community so that the problem at its root can be stopped we can stop dealing simply with the behaviors that are the symptom all too often. Finally, on the enforcement end, the BCA, as I said, is getting called upon to do more and more. Uh, and they're doing it not just in greater Minnesota, where historically that has been their role, um, but they are being called to do that more and more often as the cities are taxed to a point that they cannot respond as effectively as possible. We'd asked for 9.8 million uh, to support three areas of the BCA. Number one, a violent crime support unit, which would increase the DNA and firearms testing capacity. Gun violence is a real thing here in Minnesota. Uh, we are seeing uh, guns used in domestic violence. We're seeing guns used in robberies. We're seeing guns used in carjackings. And being able to trace those guns back to 
their source, trace them back to the straw buyers, trace them back to the felons who are possessing them, is an important component of holding people accountable. At a time when there are shortages of police officers across the state, having additional analytical support, civilian support for those officers, means that we can work smarter, because it will be a while before we can get the boots on the ground that the bills are supporting. So getting the analytical support so that we can get people on targeted enforcement, so that we can take the worst of the worst and incapacitate them, or involve them in the criminal justice system, we think is smart policing. And then finally, we are proposing a violent crime investigative partnership, which will bring together local agencies who might not have the capacity on their own to do a full-scale investigation of a gang or a drug cartel, bring them together with state agencies, federal agencies, and that, we believe, will hopefully disrupt lots of violence before they occur. The BCA has been, that kind of initiative is what helped us solve the Anaya case over in Minneapolis, a little girl who was jumping on a trampoline who was murdered by a drive-by shooting. It's that kind of investment that we're looking for that we really do believe will pay benefits as we continue to work on Trinity and Ladalion and the other babies who have been shot and killed over the last year or so. Other items that we would like to see, just in a real and brief here, a first responder wellness office. Once again, I speak to the fact that we have both police, fire, and EMS who are all struggling with having seen the worst that humanity can give us and making sure that those first responders are healthy means that we can retain them longer and that if we can retain them longer, it means that we're not trying to fill those vacancies as frequently. And so we believe that that is absolutely essential. A healthy cop is a safer cop, frankly, is something that the moms who lost loved ones to officer-involved shootings have told us and it's also something that, once again, the chiefs of police and the sheriffs support. BCA cybersecurity upgrades, we started this about three years ago. We have federal mandates as to what cybersecurity should look like. And at a time that we are being told by the president and by the NSA that Russian hacks are likely, not just likely, but are imminent, making sure that the BCA's cybersecurity is up to speed is important because the BCA is the hub that feeds all of the rest of law enforcement across the state. Finally, there is needed money for additional work for the bomb squad statewide and offices of justice programs reinvestment. These are areas where victims, whether it's housing for domestic violence, housing for survivors of crime, these are where those dollars go. And the Office of Justice Programs is the preeminent violence and victim services place at the state. Finally, we appreciate the amendment that Senator Limerick simply recently offered on the unified billing for rape kits. Our fiscal note shows that this may cost as much as $3.7 million, and that doesn't include the IT costs, which we know can be both expensive and time-consuming. And so we are anxious to work with him on this bill, on the amendment, and continue the work there. In closing, I want to thank you again for allowing me to testify today, both remotely and just being able to testify this bill. And I can tell you I'm happy to work with Senator Limerick, my prior colleague, having served on his committee, on this bill and on the new items that can come up so that we can provide public safety for the state of Minnesota broadly and in particular. And at this time, I'll stand for questions. Thank you very much, Commissioner. I appreciate you testifying. That was very informative. Any questions for the Commissioner? Yes, Senator Ingebrigtsen. Thank you, Madam Chair. I do have one. Thank you, Commissioner, for the comments. And I'm wondering, in the bill, we have money for shot spotters in Ramsey County, and I don't know how you feel about those. I understand, though, the technology has come around to the point where they can actually see the direction of the flight of the vehicle that was involved in shooting. It's an immediate notification to officers on the road without even having to go through dispatch. I see it as a pretty good tool, and I'm wondering what your feeling is on that, because I know the mayor from 
St. Paul doesn't apparently go along with it, and, and I'm wondering if he's changing his mind, if you know anything about that at all, um, considering all the shootings that are, that are going on in, the, in our capital city. And I, I just I look at it as a really good tool, and I, I appreciate Senator Limmer allowing this in the bill. So I'd just like to hear your comments on those. Commissioner. Chair Rosa and Senator Ingebrigtsen, I am absolutely in favor of shot spotter. I have testified, uh, in fact, to the mayor of St. Paul and others uh, that I believe it is a wonderful technology. It's a wonderful technology both from a crime fighting perspective. Um, as I mentioned, where there are communities where trust has been broken, they may or may not uh, report shootings or shots fired. And that means that the police are unable to be able to collect the casings, to do the investigation and do the follow up and to hold people that are using guns illegally accountable. But in addition to the crime fighting benefit that shots fighter brings, ShotSpotter also alerts the police and EMS, oftentimes it's not, so that they are moving in the right direction immediately after a shooting. And what we all know is that from a healthcare perspective, any delay in responding to a shooting uh, may allow for the victim to bleed out or to die from the wound. And so ShotSpotter both is a, has an, a benefit from public health it also has a benefit from public safety, and uh, my experience with it, both uh, in Minneapolis, uh, in other major cities, uh, and in Camden, New Jersey, where I have done a lot of study about good policing there, uh, they cited it as saving lives. And so I am very, very supportive of ShotSpotter and very appreciative of seeing it in this bill. Senator, good? Yep. That's all right. Um, I did have a question for you, Commissioner, if there was no one else. The VSET dollars, I have been uh, for years trying to uh, actively get more boots on the ground. It, sound, it seems like the tenor around drugs coming into our state has risen to another level. I'm very concerned, and people that were not particularly concerned before now are showing great concern about this. How are those dollars going to be utilized and... Um, are, are we going to be able to really be effective with, a, with this increase in funding? What is it going to Madam do, Chair. basically, Commissioner? Madam Chair, uh, I can tell you that Ken Sass, who is now running the V-SETs, he's the coordinator out of OGP for the V-SETs, he is very aggressive. He's been meeting individually with the individual V-SETs across the state. Uh, because we know that this is not just a metro area, this is a statewide problem. It is also a problem with our Native, Amer our Native American tribal reservations uh, where we are seeing drug trafficking move up. In addition though, the VSETs are an absolutely essential component of response to the violent crime that we've seen, the gun violence we've seen in the Twin Cities. That is largely gang violence and so the VSETs have also been, an have been instrumental in that. Uh, not all of them have been as successful as I would have liked. The, there was one that uh, we attempted to set up that we could not get enough bodies to staff. That was the Metro Transit uh, set. Uh, that one was not successful in its implementation because simply uh, the city of Minneapolis, uh, which is uh, down a third of its staff, did not have enough bodies to be able to really make a meaningful commitment to that particular visa. But with that one exception, I would say that we are seeing them uh, make sizable seizures. Uh, they're making good arrests and the arrests are uh, moving through the court system and holding people accountable. So I, I am very supportive of the VSETs and the increased funding there, especially because I think with this new partnership that we're working federal, state, county, and local on some of these very violent criminal organizations, we need to have that that the additional resources, it says, if you're dealing drugs in greater Minnesota and you're profiting here in the cities, that we need to be able to come together across jurisdictions to hold people accountable. Absolutely, thank you, Commissioner. I, I, it's, it's another ball game out there when it comes to the opioids um, or the uh, car fentanyl, fentanyl, it's, it's a whole nother ball game. So we need to get boots on the ground for sure. Any other further questions, comments? Wonderful. Thank you, Commissioner, so much. Good to see you. Mm -hmm. Looks like Good you're a busy you guy. Your office it looks similar to your Senate office. Well, that's <laughs> <laughs> got a lot going on there. <laughs> We're moving the paper as fast as I can. <laughs> I know you are. Very good. Thank you, sir. Uh, Commissioner Lucero, welcome to the committee. 
Hi, good morning, everyone. Good morning, Chair Rosen, members of the committee. Uh, so for the record, okay, so for the record, my name is Rebecca Lucero and I'm the Commissioner for the Minnesota Department of Human Rights. It's good to be back here with all of you today. So I am virtual and not there in person because I had to testify in both bodies this morning at the exact same time. And virtual testimony allows me the opportunity to clone myself. Um, I was able to meet recently with Chair Limmer in person to discuss our budget. And of course, I'm happy to follow up with um, Chair Rosen or anyone else in person as well. So as the state civil rights enforcement agency, the staff at the Minnesota Department of Human Rights work hard every day on behalf of Minnesotans. We are a small agency. Um, we have a large responsibility to serve every county in Minnesota. Now, so that's why I wanted to testify today. I wanted to encourage you to consider incorporating the department's supplemental budget requests in order to strengthen civil rights protection in Minnesota. For our agency, a little bit goes a long way. And I submitted a letter to the committee that details our full supplemental budget requests. Uh, for the purposes of this committee hearing, I'm just gonna keep it brief and just highlight two of our uh, proposals. So the first is our investigator capacity increase. Investigating cases, as you all know, is a core department function. And this request in our, supplement, our supplemental budget, excuse me, helps boost support for Minnesotans by ensuring that our investigations are um, independent, um, thorough, efficient, and effective. The second piece I want to highlight is our proposal on bias and discrimination data gathering and reporting. This is an important one, so let me just talk about it with you. It's a community-driven proposal that responds to the increase of bias and hate incidents across the state. It's an issue that our agency really started zeroing in on at the beginning of the pandemic. Of course, we were watching it before, but when, it's, but when the pandemic started, the FBI warned that it expected a surge in anti-Asian bias and hate incidents. And we saw that quickly play out across the country and here in Minnesota too. One of the big challenges, though, is that anti-Asian incidents are not tracked. Um, neither are other bias or hate incidents, such as anti-Semitic or anti-LGBT incidents, unless, of course, they um, rise to the level of hate crimes, which are, of course, tracked by the FBI and at the state level by the BCA. Or if someone calls about an incident that is covered by the Minnesota Human Rights Act, we do that uh, thorough independent investigation on that end. But for the many incidents that occur that are neither criminal nor are they covered under the Minnesota Human Rights Act, there is no real coordinated, consistent tracking, reporting, analysis, um, or recommendations on next steps. So our bias and hate data gathering proposal gets at exactly that. With this proposal, we uh, work to have the resources needed um, with community groups that are leading out this work to collect, track, and analyze data so we can understand where, to what extent, and how these incidents are occurring. And then we would be in a position to report that back to you, the legislature, on what may be most effective moving forward. So as Senate File 2673 advances, I encourage the Minnesota Senate to take a more holistic approach and incorporate civil rights priorities into its omnibus bill. So Chair Rosen, members of the committee, thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify and speak in strong support of this this state agency as you finalize your supplemental budget. Of course, we are always happy to answer any questions we have. Thank you for the time today. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Um, any questions for the Commissioner? Okay. Um, thank you for being here in two places in one time. I greatly appreciate that. So no questions, so we will move on to the to amendments, and Senator Limmer, you have the A52 amendment, is that correct? No, uh, the A60 amendment. We, we did pass the A60 already. Uh, I don't know if no, there's another is. amendment oh. that I'm aware of, Madam Chair. Okay. All right. Senator Champion, welcome back. <laughs> thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, take a brief recess. Um, I have the uh, A52 amendment uh, uh, that I'd like to introduce. Thank you. Uh, Senator Champion moves the A52 amendment. And it is posted. It is uh, being passed out. Uh, may I speak to you, Madam Chair? Can you hold off until we, unless it's a delete all, maybe we should just get it in front of everybody and then we can start talking about it.
Center champion. We do not have that amendment ready. So um, they're going to go get it. And perhaps we can move on to another amendment and come back to you? Yes. Okay, yes, thank you. Yeah. If you withdraw your amendment. I withdraw my amendment. Senator Champion uh, withdraws this A52 amendment. Senator Marty. Madam Chair, I'd like to deal with the A59 amendment then because we've talked about this issue earlier about the reallocation for the, the, the supervision funding. Thank you, Senator Marty. The A59 has been posted. Um, and Senator Marty, you move the A59 amendment? We do have that one. Great. Thank you. And Madam Chair, while it's being distributed, I'll just briefly explain. I mean, I think that um, this has been discussed earlier, and that is that this was the um, agreed upon system for the new allocation, the new funding that Senator Limmer and the uh, Justice Reinvestment Initiative were proposing, but um, this is designed to track it with that, with what there was agreement from all the stakeholders involved on this being a fair way to do it. And again, this is probably going to help those that the counties, generally rural counties, that use the Department of Corrections for their felony supervision. But um, that's the gist of this amendment. Um, and I'd be glad to have, I mean, I think Mr. Turner may be able to explain. He sat in on our meetings, I believe, and, and I think you and I both were there as well. But. Mm -hmm. Mr. Turner, would you like to further detail on the A59 amendment? Um, sure, Madam Chair. Um, it, well, it's a long amendment, but I think there's a couple sections that are crucial. Uh, section 16 of the amendment uh, deletes the current Community Corrections Act formula and replaces it on page 17 with a temporary uh, formula. Uh, it's kind of a rough and ready um, get over the hump formula. I think that uh, and then the bill states that it creates the state, uh, the supervision standards committee, which is going to come up with the new permanent formula, which would be instituted in, uh, I, I guess, uh, 20, uh, fiscal year 25, uh, 24, 25. But that, I mean, that's the... If we're talking about funding here. The numbers are essentially the same, 25 million in the Senate bill, uh, basically the same, 27 or something in the governor's rec. Um, the question is not funding levels, although the governor's rec does go up quite makes quite a jump in tails. And I think the reason for that is because everyone needed, you know, once this interim formula goes into place with a, with a $23 million increase, uh, you're gonna bring on a new formula on top of that. And I, I think the legislature knows that bringing in new formulas, you can't hold anyone harmless, which is why the numbers are then jump in the tails. Uh, I think all the counties, if, if anyone's been around here, I think it's a fair to say, I can say that, that supervision has kind of been orphaned. It's kind of been taken for granted. And the need for more funding, I think, is universal. I, it, it's got universal support. But the question it always comes down to, when you're dealing with formulas, uh, who wins and who loses, and you can, you can get around that question by increasing, increasing the appropriation so much that everybody wins. Uh, but I, I think that Senator Limmer uh, has stated that his problem with uh, going ahead and giving the authority to create the new formula 
to a body outside the legislature is a problem. Uh, that is, uh, to me, that's the crux of this amendment. It, it deletes current funding, it puts in an interim formula, and then it allows for the creation of a statewide supervision committee to come up with the new formula and then also statewide supervision caseload, which the formula would be based upon, but standards, et cetera. Um, and uh, that's, Senator Marty, is that the crux of the amendment? I hope I haven't. Senator Marty. M Madam Chair, um, Mr. Turner, I believe so. The, and again, the legislature, we still have the, the power to appropriate funds. Um, I guess the issue is that in terms of the allocation, this is a fair way to do it. Um, and, and again, I, I recognize that the counties and everybody else are saying they want to have more. But again, Senator Limmer is, I think everybody's agreeing there's a need for more. This is one that will help a lot with making sure that it's fairly done and that if there's a change, if some of the counties decide they want to move from community corrections to the CPO model or something else, um, the funding will track that in, under the legislation we have here. It's kind of, it's just stuck in this current way and it's not going to accomplish the, the benefits that I think we were hoping for in the fair allocation. So, I um, mean, it, it's a, I think a choice of whether we want to recognize that this is something that all the parties to it agreed, and I, I just don't think the legislature is going to come up with a better one. If we don't like what they come up with, we, we have the power to deal with that. But, but this is a fair way, and I think the interim formula is a fair one. Uh, Mr. Turner, is it correct to say that this formula would be dispersed by the DOC in this amendment, the A59? Madam Chair, you mean you mean the money? Right. It, it would. Well, somebody would have to be the fiscal agent. I would imagine it would be the DOC. I, I don't think who's the fiscal agent. I guess really wouldn't be the the question because if it's, it goes by formula, I mean, everybody can see if put the meat in the grinder and grind it out. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I. I don't think our counties would uh, like this amendment. I don't think they... Madam Chair. Senator Pratt. Thank you. If I could just maybe tag on to your, your question, Mr. Turner, who would be the fiscal agent for the current distribution we have today? Is it DOC or is it direct aid to the counties? Mr. Madam Turner. Chair, Senator Pratt, today we appropriate, like in the bill, we appropriate to the Department of Corrections a line item for the increase in the CCA formula. You know, they have, and, and in CPO, county probation reimbursement, uh, that increase as well. We appropriate to the Department of Corrections and they make the reimbursements, um, whether it's CPO or CCA. But, but it, it is, it, the formula itself is pretty complicated. Um, but it is an open uh, transaction. I mean, you put the numbers in, you crank them through the formula, everybody sees what everybody gets. So, Senator Brandt, no? There, there was a comment that uh, I think Senator Marty made that the, um, the rural, greater Minnesota counties are going to benefit more um, with this $25 million investment than um, the community corrections or the DOC and I don't know if that's necessarily true just because well we have never fit the, the statutory requirement of the 50 percent to, to the CPOs is that correct madam chair that's correct um, actually nobody knows really who's going to benefit because the formula hasn't been written yet we have it we have an interim formula. We don't have a workload case or caseload workload based formula or whatever indexes they're going to base it on. It, it doesn't exist, and so we don't really know who would benefit ultimately. Um, 
we do know that the appropriation is so high that I don't think they're, they, I mean, it makes sense. They don't want anybody to lose because obviously they would, they would then oppose the formula. But, and that's one way to make everybody happy is to throw enough money at it. But, but also I'd like to say in Senator Limmer's bill, the $5 million reimbursement for CPO, that brings the state up to the statutory mandated 50% uh, reimbursement of uh, the salaries of supervision officers uh, involved in the CPO program. Mm -hmm. And we haven't been there since 1996. Mm. Okay. So, so basically, um, the, the second priority on the JRI was a, um, that this investment is grounded in a, I'm, I'm reading a quote, uh, grounded in a base investment plus the results of a weighted caseload study formula that is repeated every six years. Really, this A59 amendment is whether you want somebody else to do that formula or you think that the, the legislature should be the one ultimately that has that, that um, ability to adjust and make that formula. So that's, that's how I'm viewing this uh, A59. I, I believe the legislature and I agree with Senator Limmer in the fact that we, we should be in charge of that formula, the legislature. Further comments? Senator Limber, your thoughts, I am. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, let me start out, I'm opposed to the amendment. Let me tell you why. Um, if you look at the history of the probation system in Minnesota, there was a time when the legislature recognized the whole concept of local control. Probation officers work on a county level. They work in the community with those that are on supervised release. Uh, it's clearly a local function. It does have its connection to the Department of Corrections and the, and the court system. But nevertheless, uh, this is uh, this idea that we have before us in the form of the amendment is uh, basically a different philosophical approach to ours. We have two different philosophical approaches. And you'll recognize that same philosophical difference throughout the entire bill when you're comparing it with the other version in the other chamber. Uh, but on the probation issue itself, uh, I believe that, that, and I've talked to those individuals in the other two uh, delivery systems uh, that are located in counties, they have been so anxious to, uh, to believe that the legislature someday would fulfill its promise on the 50% allocation for supervised uh, release. Um, this keeps that decision uh, closer to home, closer to where the actual rubber meets the road. Um, it's it's also in the hands of a closer to the public for accountability. Uh, we have seen a lot, of, a lot of rise in giving legislative function and administration off to central authority command modules uh, that, are, that are put together in membership by appointments. Um, sometimes that is, that is uh, suitable. But in this case, this is a fairly, fairly uh, basic function of uh, the criminal justice system when it comes to sentencing. But I believe that local control should dictate and it should be in the hands of a legislative super, or not supervision, but direction and not through a, a central committee that will create its own policies and take it away from the legislature. Uh, I think it's vitally important. The, the most important element, and I think, I think everyone has recognized it, um, the old question, where's the money, uh, has been echoed by probation systems uh, for many, many years in the state of Minnesota. Uh, our bill is the first time we actually are going to live up to our promises and deliver that money for an essential 
supervisory function of state government. And I, I do want to emphasize state government policy, but administered by county administrators. That's, that's where the, the travel of policy belongs, not to boomerang back to another state agency, a committee, to create some formula that we don't even know what it's going to be. Uh, I'm very concerned about that. Uh, we've, we've recognized and we're allowing the counties to tell us what those, what those budgets are. And we'll fulfill our 50% of the bargain in the original bill. That's why I'm opposed to this amendment. Thank you, Senator Limmer. Any further comments? I do not see any. Uh, Senator Marty renews his motion on the A59 amendment. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay? No. The motion does not prevail. Okay, members, I think, um, well, I'll tell you what, Bobby Joe, we have, <laughs> Senator Champion, we have um, sake of firing up and we have environment um, starting to meet. And we were gonna come back at one o'clock. So I don't know if we can get your, your uh, amendment in before that time. So are you, everybody good with coming back at one o'clock? At one o'clock, yes. Madam Chair? Yeah. You good? Okay, good. With that, we will be recessed until one o'clock. Thank you very much. Thank you.